Thank you everybody for joining us. This is a very exciting time for me personally. It's a very exciting moment for D Free as a brand, as a movement, as a program, because we're celebrating 10 years of partnership with one of the premier financial corporations in the world. Who would ever imagine that a little group of people that started in the basement of my church looking at paying your bills on time, reducing your personal debt, investing in real estate, saving for retirement. Who would think that that little group would catch the eye of a company like Prudential? And the fact is Prudential called us and Prudential said, we're interested in knowing how we can improve the economic outcomes um, in Black America. They said that we, we've studied certain aspects of Black culture and Black financial behavior, and we've discovered that more than the general population, Black people are willing to accept help and information and instruction in church. And the faith legacy, the faith heritage of African Americans was credible in Prudential's eyes. And Prudential said, said to me, because your work is primarily faith-based, it's not exclusively faith-based, but it's born in a faith community. It focuses as a priority on faith communities around the country. And it works with other organizations, fraternities and sororities that certainly have an appreciation for the faith element in social and economic outcomes we would like to help. And from 2011 up to and including this year, 2021, Prudential has been our partner by our side, helping our people in ways that we're going to talk about today. And one of the key people in Prudential who was there then and who is here now and who has worked with us hand in hand, giving us advice, giving us support, connecting us to key resources is with us today. She's responsible for so many things at Prudential, diversity, equity, inclusion, corporate social responsibility. And she, she's up there. She, she's not just another person that comes to work every day. She's, she's a leader in this great corporation. corporation. She's been a friend and a sister to me. Uh, welcome to the launch of our 10 year Prudential D Free anniversary, Miss Letha Reddy. Thank you. It is so wonderful, as always, to be with you, Dr. Soris. So, Letha, when I tell people about the relationship we have with Prudential, uh, those who, are, who care to listen really can't believe and can't understand why a global trillion dollar company like Prudential would work with what's basically a grassroots organization helping people help people deal with their financial outcomes. And so what, what do you think the significance of the Prudential D Free Partnership is? I think there are a few core elements uh, that make this partnership and relationship so special. And to me, it really begins with a shared purpose, a shared set of values and trust. And so, as you said, you and I have known each other for a long time. Uh, you've known Prudential for a long time. And so we had a relationship prior to coming into this institutional relationship. And that mattered because uh, we know that the relational aspect, right, of knowing people in, in different settings is helpful, especially when things get tough. It's been an amazing partnership, but we've, uh, you know, there have been things along the way. In 10 years, you would expect, right, that we'd have challenges. And 
uh, you know, I do believe both organizations and entities are better for it. We've pushed each other in new ways. We've thought creatively together, problem solved together, and that's what strengthens it. But, you know, Prudential's purpose is to solve the financial challenges of a changing world. And for those who don't know, we were founded in Newark, New Jersey. We continue to be headquartered there almost 150 years later. So our commitment to diverse communities and to the black community in particular is deep, it is broad, and it remains as strong as ever. And so to come together with a trusted partner like DFree to be able to solve together right financial challenges uh, was a tremendous opportunity. And Dr. Shores, you had been so helpful in some of the research that you uh, described, right, that we had done. And so your thought leadership, your input in those early days was instrumental uh, in so many ways to the partnership that we have now. Prudential has proven to be not just a substantial part of our work, but a resourceful part that has brought resources that we just couldn't have had otherwise. And We've gone deeper and deeper and deeper, st just starting with information and education, the kind of work done primarily through financial professionals. What, what, what do you like most about the ability to connect financial professionals that work at Prudential to the people that d -free touches around the country? I think the other part of the promise of the partnership was that the whole would be greater than the sum of its parts. And so, by bringing together these two amazing platforms and leveraging the expertise that resides on both sides, we can do that, right? And uh, so what's great about bringing our financial professionals into the mix is the scale that we can bring to this. So that I think is one of the things that Prudential's platform can bring to DFree is the ability to go you know, very broad and touch as many people uh, as possible. And so, doing that through the financial expertise that uh, we can bring uh, uh, across right, the financial wellness spectrum. And so lots of different ways that we can contribute to people's learning, uh, education and their financial wellness journey. Well, you know, I always uh, joke when I describe the need for prudential uh, professionals to be involved in the work. And, and I tell people, listen, when you get your hair done, the person doing it has to be licensed. When you fly on a plane, the pilot needs to be licensed. And likewise, when you get your financial advice, you want somebody who's licensed. And you know, a lot of people don't even realize that there are specific credentials and qualifications held by people who actually give financial advice and they are financial professionals, which is why so many African-Americans do not get their financial advice from professionals. And that's what credential comes alongside of us to help us address. You know, our theme um, really focuses on both the big picture and really the small picture. Our theme is we're disrupting the wealth gap. That's the big picture. And we're talking a lot about the historical policies and practices that have that contributed to such a wide gap between the income and assets of white Americans and the income and assets of black Americans. But we also add to that tagline, one family at a time, because there is no one program, there's no one policy, there's no one personality that's going to close the wealth gap for a population as large as Black Americans. And this one family at a time focus is what impresses me about Prudential, because whether it's investing, whether it's insurance, whether it's debt counseling, whether it's student loan management, Prudential has been right by our side, bringing resources to help one family at a time. Talk about that some. Yeah, and I just wanna to speak to a point you just made, which is a critical one, the one about the you know, systemic historic barriers that have presented black Americans and other communities from receiving, uh, having access to financial advice or being able to trust, right, uh, the entities that were providing that. And so, again, by partnering and bringing our financial professionals uh, alongside you, right, a trusted partner uh, in the community, we are able to, again, provide advice in a way that people feel comfortable, they can hear it, and they can act on it because of the trust, right, that exists between our entities. And the notion of one family at a time, right, one person at a time, one family and one community, and, you know, thinking about 
scale again, because we want to reach as many people as we can. But we know that, as you said, we've got to do it right. The entry point is the person, is the family. And so starting there and working with uh, individuals and families who can then create a multiplier effect, because we know, especially right in uh, our communities, that there's so much that we do for others within our community, within our families. And so how do we uh, create that multiplier effect starting with the individual? Well, you and I had some time together a couple of years ago when we were reminiscing about some of the historic involvement that Prudential has had specifically in Newark. Having grown up around Newark, it was, it was clear to me that Newark was the beneficiary of a corporate commitment made by Prudential when many companies fled Newark after the 1967 uh, riots and many, many people fled Newark, black and white, because Newark was um, an impoverished community. Newark was suffering from the scars of having the National Guard have to come in to keep law and order. I mean, Newark was a troubled city and Prudential to its credit made the commitment to not only stay in Newark physically, but to invest in Newark, to ensure that Newark had a quality state-of-the-art art center and, and sports arena. What I, what I think people should recognize is that the, the, the social values and the commitment to uplift long, is, a, is a longstanding tradition at Prudential. And although a lot of companies now are participating in what is generally talked about as a, a racial reckoning or uh, a, a social awareness, um, our relationship certainly predates the, the most recent um, explosion, as it were, of commitment to community and diversity. And I think we've been the beneficiaries of a corporate culture from the top, from the board to the CEO to um, senior management that has embraced us as family and has come out into communities. We've done events together live, we pivoted under COVID to do online events on a regular basis. And I, I just think uh, we, are, we are blessed as a nation to have a company like Prudential that has executives like yourself who take the lead and not wait to react to incidents, but rather are proactive in prescribing and forging ahead strategies that are beneficiary uh, uh, one family at a time. Well, I appreciate that. And I think, uh, you know, we have learned along the way and our being in Newark, I think is, um, is at the heart and soul of who we are as a company because, right, we are, first of all, we're in it for the long term. We're an insurance company at our heart. Uh, and that is about managing risk over the long term. And so we understand that some of these really pressing issues, societal issues, uh, impact our business. And we also understand as a purpose driven company, the role we need to play in addressing those issues and our proximity um, you know, in Newark is, uh, we hope has given us uh, a sense of uh, right, the authenticity that we need to be able to effectively partner with organizations like DFree and address the challenges uh, in the black community. And so that ethos has been built up over time. Uh, and again, we continue to learn from our partners like you and from others. Uh, and strive to do uh, to do well every day, but it is a deep, as you said, a deep corporate commitment that does start at the top, uh, and it's you know something that's been handed on from handed on from one leader at Prudential to another uh, successively, and so that's why we've been able to maintain the long term commitment. You know, you use the word authenticity. Being a, a an African American pastor with all of the accompanying authority that comes from the pulpit. I can't be too careful in terms of forming relationships with major corporations or any, any secular entity, because when you mix the secular with the sacred, you run the risk of inappropriate um, introductions and you run the risk of introducing to the faith community uh, elements that can backfire on you and do more harm than good. Uh, what I can say about this in 10 years, and this is a part of what, what I celebrate, in 10 years of traveling to churches, large and small, 
almost every black denomination that exists in the country, AMEs, Baptists, Church of God in Christ, I have never once had anyone challenge my relationship with Prudential from an integrity standpoint. And so it really speaks to the authenticity that Prudential had long before D3 came along. And the fact that all America and Black America really respects Prudential as a brand. I have to tell you, I've had to turn down offers for relationships with financial institutions whose authenticity and whose credibility were, were not as deep as Prudential's is um, among Black people. Now, I'm going to tell you something you probably don't know. When we started in 2011, our focus was really on insurance as a product, because if you're talking about closing the wealth gap, if the assumption is that the median net worth of white Americans is 10 times the median net worth of, of black Americans, you, you're generally not gonna save your way to closing that gap. You're not gonna hit the lottery to close the gap. And insurance becomes really a strategy, not just a product where families can leave large enough amounts of money for the next generation without making a major investment in this generation and the next generation can actually close the gap. So we were really focused like a laser to ensure that the black community, which is underinsured, had access to an information about insurance products. But the more we worked together and the closer we got, the more I began peeping around Prudential to see what else, <laughs> what else you had. And what I discovered was that Prudential has much more than insurance to our previous point, financial advisors, who do general comprehensive financial planning. But then I found out about an organization called Green Path that does financial counseling for people who are drowning in debt. And, you know, we start with reducing debt as a strategy to achieve financial freedom. And so I contacted Prudential and said, listen, you know Green Path, we need Green Path. And Prudential brokered a relationship and now partnership between D3 and Green Path, and Green Path has talked to hundreds of people and will talk to thousands next year that we send to them to discuss and hopefully resolve some of their more serious and critical debt issues. How did the Green Path partnership become a part of the whole Prudential vision? So, you know, we are, uh, again, all about solving financial challenges. And part of that is starting from within. So how do we make sure that we are offering to our own employees the ability, right, and the tools and resources they need to become financially secure? Mm -hmm. So some of these partnerships emanate from work that we are doing within our own institution and services we are providing, and then taking them out and offering them to our clients and then uh, as with D-Free, offering them to our partners. And so again, that speaks to the, the whole being greater than the sum of its parts and the value of bringing these you know, two entities together is that we can then offer that to you and to uh, the audience that you are reaching so that we can, as you said, right, expand beyond uh, one individual product or solution and think about the comprehensive holistic needs that people and families have in order to become uh, financially you know, more better off. More right. Better off. So then, of course, you know, I'm, I'm basically nosy. So I kept peeping around, peeping around in response to the fact that more questions come to us concerning student loans and financing college than perhaps any other particular area of debt. And in my peeping around, what I discovered was that Prudential has another relationship with a, uh, an organization called Vault. And Vault <laughs> specializes in helping people uh, chiefly through an online platform, which is second to none. People who need to know how much their student loans are, what the balances are, what strategies are for refinancing. Uh, were you involved in, in that vote partnership also? Uh, Prudential was, and so in the same way that we wanted to make that resource available to our own employees. And we know the burden that uh, student debt creates uh, for people and the financial challenges and stressors that that puts on people. And so we wanted to make sure that our employees, again, had that tool available. And so 
uh, that is how we were able to offer it to D Free and to the audience again that we're trying to reach together. And, and folks who are watching, you have to know that again, like almost every other um, statistic, black college graduates generally graduate with more student loan debt than white college graduates because again, we come with lesser assets. Our families generally make lesser income. And so to go to college requires more borrowing in our community than it does in other communities. And so uh, while Prudential has these resources that are available, as Letha said, to their employees, to their customers and others, they are of critical value to our work because our work focuses not exclusively, but primarily on African-Americans through churches and through civic organizations, through fraternal organizations and the like. Uh, now, when COVID-19 hit, we were affected like everybody else, but in some ways we were affected more than everybody else because our style had been since 2011, traveling with Prudential around the country, visiting churches, going to events. We appeared at Essence Fest with Prudential. We went to Mega Fest with Prudential. We've gone to conventions in all of the major cities. And so the live event, the personal interaction, our mid-year conferences, our end of the year events have always been dynamic. Prudential has had a presence and the kind of presence that really has facilitated people having live one-on-one -on -one interaction with financial professionals. Then came COVID. And on April 1st, uh, 2020, we pivoted after having had two weeks to consider what shall we do in light of the, the, uh, the shelter in place orders from the governor and from the White House. And so we began doing these webinars and again, I was peeping around Prudential and discovered something called Pathways. And Pathways has this library of content delivered by financial professionals who are trained to do so. And we connected with Pathways and that team came along and added to the Prudential professionals that talk about insurance and products to the Green Path counseling, to the Vault uh, technology. And the Pathways webinars have been the basis and the content for our monthly Ask the Expert webinars, which has featured African-American financial advisors from Prudential and has received a tremendous response. We've had good engagement. We've had high attendance as compared to registration. And we think we've tapped into a strategy that's going to sustain us long after COVID. For all of the challenges of this past year, uh, the need to pivot to this virtual platform as you described has been uh, a benefit in many ways, right? Because we can reach so many more people. And while we all valued and appreciate and continue to appreciate and miss the in-person experiences uh, that we were used to, I think, uh, again, the scale piece of this is really important. We're also very pleased that we have uh, more and more financial advisors who are getting trained in the D free curriculum and who are trained in the pathways curriculum and can bring all this together uh, to again address holistic needs. Well, what you'll see from the D free side is that our future depends heavily on an expanded partnership with Prudential. We're putting up a new website, dfree.com, and we've got stronger links to Prudential products, potential people, uh, potential resources than ever before. We're making plans to hit two or three key markets to test some new strategies with Prudential. I know we're focusing very uh, significantly on Atlanta, Detroit, and North Jersey. And so I just can't tell you how excited we are about our future. We're digitizing more of our content. We are expanding to reach more young people. We have a special platform that we're doing for leaders, faith leaders and, and clergy. So, so we're excited. What's, what's in the future for Prudential? Where's Prudential going? 
that we are going to uh, stay the course on continuing to show up in the market inclusively and try to solve uh, solve the needs of a broad group of stakeholders. And the only way we can do that is through partners like D3. And so uh, we are equally committed to this partnership and excited about it and want to build on it in the ways that you described because uh, there's so much work to be done uh, and we know we need to move forward together. And uh, we are really excited and proud to be able to do that in partnership. Well, you mentioned at the start, the fact that within a 10 year relationship, there, there has to be some glitches, some ups and some downs. But I can, I can tell you this, in the last two years, what Prudential did to minimize gaps and glitches has been to have a dedicated team of people working directly with the D3 team with meetings twice a month, with email going back and forth regularly on a weekly basis. And I can't tell you how appreciative we are of, of Prudential not just making a commitment generally and a commitment rhetorically, but a commitment in terms of substance, in terms of personnel. And we couldn't be more pleased than to have the kind of team you put in place to work directly with, with me and our team we look forward to the meetings, we look forward to the updates, and we look forward to the planning that we do. And so I just want to recognize, you know, April and Nicole and Dave and, and Anthony and all of those people that are accessible to us. Uh, Alicia stops by every now and then, but uh, we, 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 we're, we're grateful to have people at Prudential who treat us like family. It's almost as if we, we are Prudential. And I just want to acknowledge that and thank you for that and thank all of the leaders of Prudential for your ongoing support. So what are your parting thoughts and parting words of wisdom for our community that really needs everything as it relates to economic empowerment and financial freedom and, and what, what they can expect from D3 and Prudential? Well, I think the, the message is to stay the course. Uh, this can sometimes feel hard and feel daunting uh, and overwhelming, but uh, we can all do it. And with the right information, the right tools, we can take the right actions. And that's the key. It's not enough to just understand. Uh, we need to act. And so I encourage all of you to continue to do that. Uh, and just know that D3 and Prudential are here to support you. Wonderful. Well, folks, you heard it directly from the upper chamber, from the executive offices of Prudential in Newark, one of the top financial firms in the world that we have the pleasure and the honor of not only working with, but getting support from. Um, the key to our partnership, in my view, is that they have made hundreds of financial professionals available who will speak to you for free, somebody say free, F-R-E-E, -E. a financial professional who wants to charge you just to talk, run quickly, call us and we'll get you one that'll sit down with you because Prudential is not trying to cram products down our throats. Prudential is trying to help us through professionals take a look at our entire situation, our income, our expenses, our goals, our challenges, and then help us think through a strategy, which if their products can be a part of, that's great. But if their products don't fit the strategy they'll help us create, then they'll send us on our way someplace that can help us. And that's what I love about their integrity, their authenticity, and their generosity. So thank you, Letha. Thank you to the whole team. And thank all of you. I know you're probably zoomed out by now. We've been online and virtual for everything from church to doctor's visits since, since March of last year. But listen, we've got to make the most of what we have. My old expression is the only thing worse than not having what you need is not using what you have. So we're using this platform. We're using this technology. Stay tuned because we've got all this month, the entire month of October, we've got experts, we've got testimonials, we've got information and hopefully inspiration to help you understand the potential of disrupting the wealth gap one family at a time. Thank you for watching. 
Hello, my name is Kristen McIntosh, and I would like to begin by thanking Prudential and DFree for inviting me to be part of today's forum. I'd like to share some reflections on the racial wealth gap that persists in our nation. And I'll begin by offering a definition of wealth. Wealth can be defined as the difference between a household's assets and debt. And the examination of wealth is of particular importance because wealth confers benefits that go far beyond those associated with family or personal income. In fact, wealth holds several advantages over wages as an economic resource. For example, wealth allows people to take career risks, knowing that they'll have a buffer if success is not immediately achieved. Wealth affords people opportunities to become entrepreneurs and inventors. And family wealth enables young adults, even those who have just entered the workforce, to still access housing and safe neighborhoods with great schools, thereby enhancing the prospects for their own children. The income from wealth is taxed at much lower rates than income from work, which means that ultimately, wealth begets more wealth. And finally, wealth is a safety net that keeps a life from becoming derailed by temporary setbacks and the loss of income. The latter was particularly evident last year when the COVID-19 pandemic inflicted devastating effects on the United States economy, with job losses especially concentrated among women, minorities, and low-wage workers. And unfortunately, the Black-White wealth gap left many households with far fewer resources to weather that storm. The Black-White wealth gap is not a recent phenomenon. Rather, it's a continuation of centuries-long trends in wealth inequality within the United States. Efforts by Black Americans to build wealth can be traced back throughout American history. But unfortunately, these efforts have been impeded in a host of ways. Beginning with 246 years of chattel slavery and followed by congressional mismanagement of the Freedmen's Savings Bank, which in 1874 left over 61,000 depositors with losses of nearly $3 million. There was the violent massacre decimating Tulsa's Greenwood District in 1921. And discriminatory policies continued throughout the 20th century, such as Jim Crow and the Black Codes, which strictly limited opportunity in many Southern states. The GI Bill, where Black veterans were prevented from accessing many of its housing provisions. The New Deal's Fair Labor Standards Act, which exempted domestic and agricultural service occupations, which at the time were widely held by many Black Americans. And of course, the practice of redlining within the mortgage and banking industry. Wealth was taken from these communities before it had the opportunity to grow. And this history matters for contemporary inequality because its legacy is passed down generation to generation through unequal monetary inheritances, which make up a great deal of current wealth. Just last year in 2020, Americans were projected to inherit about $765 billion in gifts and bequests, excluding wealth transfers to spouses, as well as transfers that support minor children. And much of this inherited income will go untaxed by the federal government. Wealth is the sum of resources available to a household at a point in time. And while it is clearly influenced by the income of a household, the two are not perfectly correlated. Two households can have the same income, but the household with fewer expenses or more accumulated wealth from past income or inheritances is going to have more wealth overall. And what's immediately evident is that the racial wealth gap remains, even for families with the same income. For those in the top 10% of income, just over three and a half percent of black earners, the racial wealth gap remains quite large. The median net worth for white families in this income group 
is over $1.7 million versus approximately 343,000 for black families. In fact, a racial wealth gap exists in every income group except the bottom 20% of earners where the median net worth is zero for just about everyone. So just how large and persistent are these racial wealth gaps? Well, the racial wealth gap remains even when we look within age groups. The typical young adult between the ages of 18 and 34 years old of either race has little wealth, but the gap rises quickly with age. Between the ages of 65 and 74 years old, $302,500 is the median wealth gap that's accumulated for white Americans versus just 46,000 in median black wealth. So why are high and middle income white families so much wealthier than black families with the same incomes? First of all, white families receive much larger inheritances on average than black families do. And research has shown that inheritances and other intergenerational transfers of wealth account for more of the racial wealth gap than any other demographic or socioeconomic indicators. Black families who become high earners in particular years are also more likely than white families to drop out of the top earning level in subsequent years. So their respective wealth levels might reflect this difference. And finally, high and middle income black families may be more likely than their white counterparts to be called upon to provide economic assistance to family members or neighbors. It's also important to recognize that the black-white wealth gap can intersect with the gender wealth gap. And it's really important to note that these racial and gender wealth gaps and their intersection cannot simply be attributed to differences in household savings patterns or cash flow management challenges. Rather, they are the outcome of public policy decisions spanning centuries throughout US history. And this intersection of the racial and gender wealth gap is clearly illustrated by the following statistic. The median wealth of a single white man under the age of 35 is around $22,640. This figure is three and a half times greater than that of single white women. It is over 14 and a half times greater than that of single black men. And it is over 224 times greater than that of single black women. So this raises the question, what is the primary cause of the racial wealth gap? Well, there is no single simple explanation for the racial wealth gap. The gap is not explained away by differences in educational attainment. Although we may hope that education is a great equalizer, college does not eliminate or even substantially reduce racial or ethnic wealth gaps. Unfortunately, black families have median wealth that is less than white families with the same education. In fact, black families with a bachelor's degree have much less wealth than white families with similar degrees. And black families with bachelor's degrees even have less median wealth than the typical white family holding only high school diplomas. The wealth gap can also not be explained away by indebtedness since white families actually tend to have higher levels of debt. Black families are less likely than white families to own various types of assets and often have lower valued assets when they do. For example, in 2019, 73% of white families compared to just 42% of black families owned a home. In fact, black families are only not just less likely to own a home, but their home ownership also yields lower levels of assets. In 2019, the typical white family's home value was approximately 230,000 compared with just 150,000 for black families. So with fewer non-liquid assets to borrow against or to sell, the black-white wealth gap is further exacerbated, leaving black households particularly vulnerable to economic shocks, such as the loss of income that was experienced widely during the COVID-19 recession. 
Finally, we should look at what types of public policies can close the racial wealth gap. The solutions that the Black-White wealth gap and the policies that address racial inequity, they must be broad and bold. Reforming the rules surrounding inheritance or state taxes in particular could enhance the quality of opportunity, especially if those revenues were reinvested in programs that give low-income children a better chance at economic success. Also, avoiding the conflation of income with wealth will be imperative when designing public policies aimed at addressing the racial wealth gap. While a stronger safety net and additional income support can absolutely provide families with immediate protection against economic crises, it is unlikely to provide them with the long-term stability that can prepare them to weather future economic shocks in the same way that having access to wealth can. Indeed, closing the Black-White wealth gap will require that the deep and systemic economic disparities brought about by centuries of discriminatory policies are ultimately addressed through significant systemic and structural changes across a wide range of policy areas. Again, my name is Kristen McIntosh, and I thank you for your time today. Greetings. Hello, my name is Dana Peterson, and I am the Chief Economist at the Conference Board. I'm going to be discussing how we can close racial inequality gaps in America. Well, let's first take a look at how much these gaps are costing us. Some of the gaps include wages, education, home ownership, and also business access to capital. And all of these gaps contribute to the overall wealth gap that we see between Black Americans and their peers in America. We did a study and we found out that if we added up these gaps over the last 20 years, it would be equivalent to $16 trillion. That's right, $16 trillion, which is an astounding number. Let's look at how we came up with this number. Let's talk about the racial wage gap. If we looked at the amount of money that white Americans, in particular white males, are making relative to their cohorts, the difference is $6.8 trillion over the last 20 years. And if we compare, made the comparison between white males and black Americans, then that difference would be $2.7 trillion over the last 20 years, or a loss of two tenths of GDP each year that black Americans aren't generating for the economy. Let's look at the, take a look at the next gap, high access to higher education. So if we looked at the difference between the number of people, uh, in particular white persons who are earning college degrees versus black persons, we'd see a pretty significant gap. And if we added up the lifetime income that black Americans are missing out of over a 20 year period, well, that we saw over the last 20 years, then it would be equivalent to anywhere from 90 to $113 billion, which is just astounding. Imagine what you can do with that amount of money in terms of investing in your families and investing in your communities. Another gap is with respect to housing credit access. When we look at the number of black households that could have been created if they had access to housing, it would have equated to 770,000 black homeowners. Imagine if each of those black homeowners then bought a car or bought furniture or appliances or lawn care equipment for those homes, we would have added up roughly $218 billion in GDP over that time period of 20 years. So this is again, really astounding numbers. And then finally, if we look at fair and equitable lending for black entrepreneurs, Roughly $13 trillion in business revenue was not created over the last 20 years because black businesses either did not have money or access to credit to keep, keep their doors open or they were never able to create those businesses at all. Another way of looking at it is looking at thinking about how many jobs were not created. Roughly 6 million jobs a year were not created because black entrepreneurs did not have access to credit and financing. The interesting thing is that when we look at the different uh, points of financing, uh, black entrepreneurs are actually pretty equal in terms of their ability and actually slightly better in terms of their ability 
of gaining or collecting funds early in early stages of financing, such as gaining money from friends and family or from their own personal savings. However, when you look at, at subsequent rounds of financing, they trail behind their white counterparts, including access to capital from banks, uh, venture capitalists, um, capital markets, angel investors. Indeed, a study by the Small Business Association revealed that for Black Americans or Black entrepreneurs, they are the most likely group to be denied access to funding at every level of financing, whether they are asking for credit cards, uh, money from angel investors, money from friends and family, or even from banking and credit unions, they are the most likely to say that they did not receive the amount of funding that they requested. Now, some of this may have to do with things like credit scores, but again, many of these people are already successful and already very driven and have already raised their own capital from amongst their own sources. So there's got to be something else here. So what if we close all of these gaps? the wage gap, education, housing, and also access to financing. Well, we could generate almost $5 trillion through the next five years in terms of GDP, or that's roughly a half percentage of GDP growth every year. If we think about how quickly the U.S. economy was growing before the pandemic, the U.S. is growing about 2.5%. If we could add another half percent, that's 3% growth. That's really outstanding growth. And that would be achieved just by getting rid of these gaps between what uh, African Americans and Black Americans in the U.S. are facing in terms of, of generating wealth versus their white counterparts. So what can governments, individuals, firms, and nonprofits do to help close the racial inequality gap? Well, first, let's just think about the government. Certainly when we think about monetary policy, it's so important for the Federal Reserve to think about what, how its policies are impacting communities of color and making sure that it's focused on its dual mandate, not only low inflation, but also making sure that there's full employment, that everyone is being employed, including persons of color. There's also financial inclusion, um, making sure that that governments implement laws that ensure that no one is left out, especially with respect to employment. Governments can also provide housing incentives and tax reforms that are beneficial for people to start building wealth. Um, Another idea is guaranteed income. Others are investing in building wealth. And then finally, providing laws such as salary history bans that, that, that would enable people who would normally be excluded from being able to advocate for their own wages. Now, in terms of firms, there's internal work as well as external work that can be done. Internally, firms can make sure that they are supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. They can also ensure that they have diverse slates when they're hiring, making sure that they have retention initiatives to keep the best talent of color and also reviewing firing plans and making sure that communities of color are not unduly harmed whenever there's reduction in in staffing. And then externally, businesses can think about corporate social responsibility, investing in your community, and then also making sure that you're developing metrics and tracking to see whether or not you are actually meeting those goals. And then most importantly, well, also importantly, is adding Black board members, not just one, but many, to have that voice in terms of advising companies on how best to make sure that they are addressing their DE&I initiatives, both internally as well as externally. Thinking about individuals, well, before we go there, just thinking about nonprofits, nonprofits can partner with firms, partner with individuals, partner with communities, and partner with governments, as well as educate and advocate in terms of closing these racial economic gaps. And then finally, what can individuals do? Well, there's a variety of things that that individuals and persons can do. First of all, educate. Education, making sure that you're educating yourself in financial literacy. Um, Deferred gratification. That means investing, not only in yourself, but in your financial well-being. And then there's embracing risk. Many of us may have insurance, but it's important to also invest in stocks 
and bonds and commodities and other types of assets and, that, and housing that build wealth over time. Also advocating your, for yourself, especially on the job, making sure that you're asking for bigger responsibilities, the stretch assignment, the international assignment, uh, more advanced uh, activities, whatever it is, make sure that you're speaking up for yourself. Also be mobile, be willing to move around the country, move around the world, or just move positions, move jobs, change careers, do things that will allow you to be able to, to increase your, your knowledge as well as your income so that you can build wealth. And then finally, flex your political power in your communities at the ballot box. Make sure that your voice is being heard. So again, these racial inequality gaps are very costly, costing the U.S. economy and all of us roughly $16 trillion over a 20-year period. However, if we close these gaps, we could generate so much growth that would benefit not only Black Americans, but all Americans. Thank you so much for your time. All right, folks, again, thank you for joining us. We are focused on disrupting the racial wealth gap. And that assumes that there is a racial wealth gap. And by now, you know, as I know, that when you look at Black America, all of the data indicate that in almost every category, we're, we are behind every positive category. We're, we're ahead in some negative categories. And what I did not want us to do was to complete the conversation by simply analyzing and describing history. History is important. It's important to know how you got where you are, but I think it is at least equally important to know how to get where you'd like to go. And my guest is such a special person. I could not avoid having her a part of this series because she and I have been working together now for over 10 years. She is a writer. She's prominently featured in the Washington Post. She has published books. Her most recent book is really relevant for what we're talking about because she's talking about what to do with your money, what kind of decisions you make in times of crisis. And we've been in times of crisis now for a while. And she's a wife and a mother and she's just got the personality and she's got the prescription for not just Black America, but especially Black America as we find ourselves really at the bottom of the economic ladder having to climb our way out. And so let me welcome and introduce to some and present to others, Michelle Singletary from the Washington Post and every place else in the world. Michelle, it's so great to see you. Well, thank you so much for having me. You know, I'm a huge fan of yours, Dr. Suris. You've been in this field for quite a long time before it was, you know, popular, really. It was popularized now. Um, so I know that you have a great compassion um, and mission to help people um, do better with their money. So I'm, I'm just honored to be here with you. So, Michelle, let me just frame this in preacher talk. You know that in the Old Testament, there was a prophet named Ezekiel. And in chapter 37 of his book, it says that he was visiting a valley full of dry bones. Mm -hmm. And by the time he left that valley, the bones had come back to life. And when I talk about that, I think about you because there's some people who, if they had been Ezekiel, they would visit the valley of dry bones they would write a book about dry bones and just leave and the bones would stay dry. Other people would get a grant to manage the dry bones and the bones would not benefit. But like Ezekiel, you are someone who looking at America and black America in particular, instead of just analyzing the problem or describing the problem, you give prescriptions day in and day out. You give advice, you give practical suggestions on how these bones can live. What kind of advice are you giving today now that we are still dealing with COVID? Many of us didn't recover from the financial crisis. What kind of advice are you giving us now as dry bones? 
Yeah, that's such a great question. And actually, if I can dig into scripture, you know, a lot of my advice, even before there's a crisis, and that's the one thing you can't think about it is just now because there will always be an economic crisis or downturn. It's not a matter of if, but when. And that's sort of the focus of my book that when a crisis hits, but it's always going to be one. And I take from inspiration in, in, in the Bible, actually Joseph in Genesis, where he, you know, interpreted the Pharaoh's dream. There was going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And during that seven years of plenty, he saved, he put things away, he grain food for the people, but not just the people of Egypt. He, he saved more than what he would, you know, essentially need for his family. Mm -hmm. uh, what he didn't know is that that was going to help his extended family. His father told his brothers, go up there. They've got extra. Right. And that's what really we have to um, focus on, not just what saving enough for your own household, but building that extra. So when those seven years of famine came, he had enough for his household, Egypt, and then some. And really, that's what we're talking about. Prepare yourself now for the next crisis. It is hard for me to get people to save and invest in things that they need to do when they're in their time of plenty because they right. don't see an end to it. This pandemic will pass and guess what? There'll be another one. It may not be as severe as this one. So practically speaking, what I've put in place at my church and in Prince George's County is a financial program. It's a year long program, not one off webinar or, you know, workshop. So in every single month we meet for about two to three hours and we go over financial topics and we teach people how to make better decisions financial decisions we teach people how to get rid of their sense of entitlement we look at how you can save how to get out of debt we give you actual items to get out of debt and so while we're talking about policy and the politics and the history because it, systemic racism it's not just history. It is our now. Right. Um, but, but, but since we know that that is a work in progress, you personally have to do some things. And one of the top things is going back to Joseph is to save when you can and not accumulate debt. And if you have debt, get rid of it as quickly as you can, because when that crisis hits, you'll be able to weather that storm, that famine a little bit longer. So with the cost of living being so high and now inflation is beginning to creep up, according to the experts, how do we say, what is it we have to do to actually save? Because, you know, most of us are living paycheck to paycheck right mm -hmm. now. So if you are, I, I sort of put people in different categories. So those are people who are in, who are in dire need. It, it makes no sense to tell them to save. They can barely put food on the table. And so you have to give them resources to make sure they keep a roof over their head and food on the table. So that community programs, food pantry, hey, listen, your community, your family, right. um, you've got to build up a savings of goodwill so that if you've got good relationships with family members and friends, that they can assist you where the government leaves off and can't. Um, so for example, you know, I had a relative who lost her job because of the pandemic. She worked in hospitality at a restaurant and I found out through another relative cause she's so proud. She wouldn't tell me. And my husband and I paid her rent for a couple of months and we didn't lend it to her. We just said, Hey, we know you're in trouble. Here's some money. We are not, we don't ever have to talk about this. There is no, you don't ever have to pay me back. I, we don't think anything about it. She says, no, no, I want to pay you back. Absolutely not. And when I sent the money in a little memo, I said, this is not a loan. And we have not talked about it all. And then, because I know she's still trying to get back. She got her job back, but you know, it takes some time. So we sent her some extra money to sort of help her catch up. And so you've got to give, even when the person doesn't, ask you and you got to be on be able to receive that help right. but that Which means, means you've got to have some things, good there are some things you could have done with that money for yourself that's but, right you know we, we we have to recognize the fact that we are blessed to be a blessing that's right that that's we right. have in order to give and that category of persons should be able to benefit from the many of us that are doing well not just individually but institutionally sorority that's right. churches, churches. that's right 
can yeah, do absolutely as right. We can, yeah. Yeah. So that's one and, you know, it's interesting if I could just add this really quick, because right now in that dire category, those people and some of them, many of them didn't handle their money. Well, let's just be real. Okay. Um, and now we have a tendency to wag our finger and say, we're not going to help them because you should have done better. Well, you know what? The scripture also talks about if somebody's hungry, don't be giving them no lecture, give them food. And right. it is through that food that you actually show them goodwill and grace and they can turn their life around. And then the other category of people is that you are, you didn't lose your job. You're doing okay, but you were living paycheck to paycheck, even though you had enough. And so now you need to carve out, a, <clears throat> excuse me, every single paycheck that you get, if you're in that category, you ought to be saving money. And so how much? Well, I'm a Christian, so 10% goes to my church, a gross of our income, both my husband and I, 15% goes towards retirement planning, and then 5% goes to either an emergency fund or what I call a, law, uh, um, a life happens fund so that you don't rob the emergency fund. Emergency fund is if you lose your job, the life happens fund is your car breaks down. And so right. that's how I break it down to people. Right, you know, Michelle, you know, you know my story. It was late in my life when I started saving for retirement, and so what I had to do after my boys finished college, even I had to, after I paid my 10% tithe, I took 35% of yeah. my income and invested that in my retirement. And so I lived off of 55% wow. of my gross income. And it's that kind of decision-making that I think we have to take seriously. That's Otherwise right. we'll be waiting for racism to end. We'll be waiting for reparations and we'll be waiting longer than we can live. That's exactly right. And, and your, to your point, the longer you wait, the more percentage of your income you have to devote to that. In your case, it was 35%. If you're just starting out in your 20s and 30s, it's that 15%. But as, clo as you get closer to your retirement years, that percentage is going to go up. So it would be 30 or 40%, but who can do that? So that's why you have to do it as soon as you can. But if you haven't, and let's say they can't do the 35% that you did, that's okay. Do what you can but you're going to have to make some other decisions for example you're not going to be able to retire at 55 or 65 you might actually have That's to right. try to continue to work till 70 or you might have to have shared housing situations i'm a huge a, um, a proponent okay. of multiple generational housing and shared housing where you know two unrelated people share a house or relatives share a house. Right now, our oldest daughter, we begged her to come back home after her graduate program so that she can save and build up um, uh, savings for herself. And, you know, at first she was like, uh, you know, people are living with my parents. And I, then she saw how much it costs to live on her own and how much she could save. And so now guess what? She's saving um, 10 to 15% of her uh, salary towards retirement. And she's never going to have a car note because she's saving for her next car to pay cash with it because she's living with us. Right. And so right. if you can't do it on your own, you need to get with someone else to sort of help reduce those big costs. You know, what I love about your presentations, whether they're physical, virtual, or in writing, you, you come down hard <laughs> spending money before you earn it. That's we right. We normally call that credit and debt. To help, help people understand the dangers of debt and the way to get control of debt. Well, you know, scripture says that when you're a borrower, you're a slave to the lender, and that's so true. Um, I learned this from my grandmother, you know, that she... Get, she taught me how to hate debt. I like to joke that if debt was a person, I'd slap it. That's how much <laughs> I hate it, right? Because it limits your opportunities. It limits your choices. Even that mortgage, we are drilled and I like, there's good debt and there's bad debt. That is just complete nonsense. There's right. only debt. There's only behold, you are beholden to the lender. And oftentimes if I was in person, I'd ask how many people were homeowners. And, and if it's a black audience, about 40% would raise their hand because that's about the own homeownership. If it's a mixed race or white audience, it would be more like 70%. How many homeowners? Oh, you know, 70% raise their hand. Then I say, well, how many of you are homeowners? Everybody's like, 
Well, I just raised my hand. I said, mm, how many of you own your house all right? Because then you're a homeowner. If right. you have a mortgage, you are nothing more than a renter. You right. you know, you have property and maybe you're building equity. So we like to talk about that equity. Well, okay, how do you access that equity? So I don't even count the equity in my home. I count it on my net worth statement, but it's not part of my cash flow because how do I access it? Two major ways. Either I've got to sell, then when I'm going to live, and the, or I've got to borrow it to right. access it. That's not good financial planning either. I'm a huge homeowner um, advocate. I've owned my home since a year out of college, but I don't count on that money. So right. you've got to do something outside of that um, to make sure you've got that money for that cash flow when a crisis happens. Yeah. Michelle, are you getting a lot of questions from especially younger people about cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Forex? That seems to be a growing phenomenon, especially among our, our millennials who yeah. see these ads and they get caught up in these schemes because it looks like they can get rich very quickly. Yeah, you know, I, I do get quite a few questions about it. And listen, while it is an investment vehicle, it is speculative. And if you are not in the position to lose all that money and not even care about it, then that is not where you should be. If you have debt, if you don't have savings, you don't have some security, that is not what, what you should be doing. I don't have any investments in speculative markets because I can't afford to lose any money and I make good money and I have a lot of savings and investing and I wouldn't do it. It is for a group of people who like just want to play. It's a, it's a can to gambling and when i go to las vegas a few times i've gone i i don't gamble because i just don't want to lose that hard-earned money um right. so while it has a place in some people's portfolio and it would be tiny like one to five percent if that much um, for the average investor particularly for the average african-american investor this is not the place to be agree you know, as we bring this to a close, I, I just, you know, I could talk to you all night. And in <laughs> fact, if we went on camera, we probably would talk all night. <laughs> we would. But, but I think be, because we're dealing with this racial reckoning, as the media calls it, in the post-George Floyd era, and because so many corporations and many government agencies have made new commitments to address the uplift of the Black community, what, what, what should we be doing as Black people in response to racism and in light of our economic needs, should we just surrender? Should we wait? What what should we be doing? What should our perspective be on the whole race issue and what our economic status is? I think that we should definitely continue the fight. Uh, we have come a long way. You know, from the time when we couldn't go to colleges that we want, we couldn't live where we want, we, we were shut out completely from certain jobs. So we've come a long way. Um, and we need to continue to fight systemic racism. When, the, when you see it on your job, file a lawsuit. You know, go to the EEOC and file those complaints to hold those companies and corporations accountable. But the other thing is, we need not to carry that baggage that somehow we are less than because when you talk, when you quote those figures about the difference in net worth or wealth between blacks and whites, you got to put that in context. It is not that because we don't know how to handle our money. It's because that the majority of the net worth for white Americans is tied up in their home. And how did they get that? Because they could get the loans. Because when the, when, when the um, soldiers came back for the GI Bill, they were able to get those, you know, very good loans where we were shut out. We were shut out of neighborhoods. If you took my house and put it in a white neighborhood, it would be worth 20 to 30 to 40 percent more and what is the difference i live in a great neighborhood no crime i got deer in my backyard the only difference is the color of the skin of the of my neighbors and so we have to fight that but that doesn't mean i'm going to live here because this is where i want to live so knowing that that my home is going to be wealth worth uh, worth a little bit less. So I, you know, do as much in my um, investments as I can. You know, I max out our retirement. We have a non-retirement investment account and a index growth, low income uh, fund. And so that's how you make up for the racism that we didn't, didn't do. We, you know, we are not responsible for it. 
um, but that we know still exist. Um, so I say that to say that when you hear those statistics, don't, don't repeat that in a way that, well, you know, black people like to spend on sneakers and you know, we like to get our hair done. That is not why we do not have wealth. It is because we didn't have access to those jobs. When we get to a company, we only get to go so far before we hit that ceiling. Now, I'm not saying that we don't do some things to not handle our money well. Of course we do. All of America does, you know, but there are some roadblocks that were there that prevented this. So I don't, I don't subscribe to that when people say things like that, because there's just so whole statistic that, you know, a black dollar stays in the community for an hour in a white community. That is bogus. There's no study that has actually shown that. So we need to take pride in the fact that we came from enslaved people. And that in my lifetime, we fought to have the right to vote. We, in my lifetime, we felt, we fought to have the right to live where we are, to have the job where I have right now. In my lifetime, when I was born, I could not have worked at the Washington Post as a personal finance syndicated columnist. We need to be proud of the history of how we fought, but we can't rest on that laurel. But we also should not criticize ourselves for things that were in place that prevented us from going forward. So I love that this conference has looked at the practicality, the politics, the policy, and also what we can do personally. So while I'm fighting that other battle, I'm also telling you, look, you can't do what they do over there because we are still far behind them. So we have to be better at how we handle our money so that when we get that freedom one day where we don't have all this racism, boy, we're going to be taken off. That's exactly right. No one says it better than Michelle Singatory, who is at the Washington Post, syndicated columnist, author, mother, wife, and church leader. Thank you, Michelle, for Thank reminding you. us that we have these barriers and therefore we have to work harder to invest in ourselves, in our children and in our future. God bless you and I can't wait to get back together with you when we go back to live events so that we can stand in front of thousands of people and do exactly what we like to do most. God bless you. Thank you so much and I am looking forward for that day as well. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.